So hello, thank you very much for joining the today's webinar at the New York Botanical Garden. And my name is João Araújo. I'm the assistant curator in mycology on the Institute of Systematics Botany. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all for today's seminar presented by Dr. Larissa Triavelier Pereira. She uh, has been working on the wild mushrooms and her uh, edible wild mushrooms and her talk today title is Wild edible mushrooms from a Brazilian perspective. So at any time during this, this talk, you're welcome to submit questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your window. And we'll gather these uh, questions for after the, the talk and she can answer the question. So please be sure to put the questions and not the chat, all right? And live captions can be enabled by click the CC button and then show subtitles or view, view full transcript. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available at NYBG Lecture Library. So just a few words about uh, my colleague, Larissa. So she's Dr. Larissa Trivelli Pereira is a Brazilian mycologist. She's a professor and researcher and has been studying many aspects of mushroom biology since the beginning of her undergrad course back in 2003. So she has been working on that for almost oh, 20, not almost 21 years, quite impressive. Her master's and PhD studies focus on taxonomy of macrofungi, and she has been investigating wild edible mushrooms, mycophagy, and ethnomycology. And Larissa is one of the most productive colleagues I have in mycology, so her CV is quite impressive. She's very productive and described lots and lots of new species of mushroom in Brazil, Japan, and many other places. So please join me, welcome me, Dr. Larissa Pereira. So please, Larissa. You're on the lead now. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, João. Well, thank you very much for the presentation, but actually I'm very happy to be here so I can talk about something that I love that are the Brazilian mushrooms. So I think it will be nice to show about the diversity of mushrooms that we have here. Uh, I had to share the, the presentation, so please don't tell me if it's working fine. Yeah, can you see? Okay? Yes, yes, looks perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you, João, and the New York Botanical Garden for this space where I can talk about wild edible mushrooms uh, here in Brazil. So when I say that here in Brazil, sometimes people get confused about where am I? Because Brazil is huge, right? <laughs> so I just have here a map so you can see where I am now because I travel all around Brazil uh, looking for mushrooms and study mushrooms. And now I'm living in Angatuba, which is a very small city in the state of Sao Paulo. So I live in the state in Sao Paulo, but not in the city of Sao Paulo. The city of Sao Paulo is huge, of course, one of the largest in the world. So my city is about three hours driving from Sao Paulo, but it's, it has only 25,000 inhabitants. So it's a very small city, uh, small city. And, but I think it's nice, you know, because I'm my, a mycologist, so I work with mushrooms, with fungi. So when you live in a small city, uh, I usually get to the field. So this is a pasture here near home where I can find mushrooms, wild edible mushrooms. And uh, we also have some forest fragments, especially uh, by the rivers. We also have some forest reserves here near the city. So I like now living in a small city after, after traveling for big cities in Brazil, uh, doing my master, my PhD, the postdoc. So now I'm in a small city and I have time to go look for, for these mushrooms. And many times I go with my kids, which is very funny. So I can also show them about my work and they, they also get interest about mushrooms. I think this is very important because as I'm going to talk with you today, we don't have this mushroom hunting or mushroom foraging uh, tradition here in Brazil, at least not in, in urban areas in big cities. So I was, I was always fascinated with this, with, with mushroom hunting, but we don't have, um, I think we lost, but we don't have this tradition here in Brazil, at least in cities and big cities, we don't have this. I'm talking about some uh, 
uh, indigenous communities that we still have in Brazil that still use mushrooms in, in their diets. So, as I told you, I'm a mycologist. I work with mushrooms and I am taxonomist, which means my job is to describe, uh, to investigate uh, which fungal species we have here in Brazil, to describe new species sometimes, which is something very uh, exciting. And, but sometimes people don't understand my job and they always want to find why I'm, I'm taxonomist. So sometimes people come to talk with me and say, oh, so what do you do for a living? And I'm just like, okay, I'm a biologist. And then people say, okay, I have some bats in my roof. Like, no, no, wait, uh, I'm a biologist, but I work with mushrooms. Ah, oh, okay, great. So I have some mushrooms in my garden. I wonder if I can eat it. Well, now I have some answers for that before I did it. I was just working with uh, mostly mushrooms from forests. And my job was to describe these new species. And people want to know why I was describing the species. Were they important for uh, as a food, as a medicine? And as a biologist, I have this. Uh, I know that they're important for the environment, but sometimes the public, people don't understand that. So now working with the uh, edible mushrooms, um, I see that people pay more attention <laughs> about what I'm talking about. You know, it's funny that finally I found some connection with the public is when I talk about edible mushrooms, sometimes people stop to listen <laughs> before they did it. So sometimes people stop to listen. And then I see there an opportunity to start talking about fungal biology, how important they are for the environmental, why we need to conserve uh, these species. So I, I think that now I found this link. So fungi is a very diverse group of organisms. We have now about 150,000 species described. It's a large number of species. But we have microfungi, microfungi. So when I say how many mushrooms do we have, I'm talking about macrofungi, right? So this is about 25,000 species of mushrooms that we have. And how many of them are edible? Sometimes people ask this, how many species are edible? Well, just about 10%. And then automatically people think, okay, so if 10% of these mushrooms are edible, this means that 90% are toxic. I'm like, no, of course not. Well, about 1% of mushrooms are toxic, just a small number. And then again, people ask, okay, but what about the rest? Well, the rest is just there living, doing their ecological service, in the nature, in the forest. So not all of them have this use. Not all of them have some uh, use as food or as medicine. So this number, uh, we have a recent study from last year from Lee and collaborators that they could uh, list about 2,200 species of edible mushrooms. Of course, we have more to discover. So we have this number between 2,000 and 3,000 uh, edible species. And in more than 90 countries, we have the use of mushrooms as a food source. So people go out in the woods to look for mushrooms, to find mushrooms to sell, or maybe to bring back home and cook uh, for the families. Women have a very special uh, role in this, uh, in this culture to gather and cook mushrooms all around the world. So we know that um, human beings and mushrooms have this ancient relationship, of course. So humans know mushrooms since the beginning of humankind, uh, sometimes because they were food, and they could be considered uh, sacred foods. For example, ancient Egypt, they were considered ancient, um, I'm sorry, sacred food. So only the royalty could eat mushrooms. But we also had some communities that use mushrooms in ceremonials and rituals because some uh, mushrooms are uh, neurotropic and hallucinogenic. So some communities have this uh, this view that mushrooms were sacred because they could talk to gods when they use mushrooms. But we know we have archaeological uh, evidence that food was uh, mushrooms were using as food by, by humans, by human beings for a long time. And 
I think it's kind of obvious, you know, they were using plants and animals and why not mushrooms? It's a very important source of food. So we have some archeological evidence uh, from Spain. For example, there's this mummy from 18,000 years ago and there are some small pieces of mushrooms in the teeth, they can find it. And also they, they found out that uh, Homo neanderthalis, so neanderthal man, they also had mushroom in their diet. So of course, this, this, this relationship is very old. Also, uh, mushroom hunting is an old tradition in many countries. Uh, in America, I know you have this tradition and I always found it fascinating that people have this, sometimes they have these childhood memories and uh, that they go out in the woods with their parents or their grandparents to search for mushrooms, to look for mushrooms and return home and cook together. I was always fascinated with this. I, I really wanted to understand about the mushrooms we have in Brazil, if we, we could eat them. And I think now we have some answers. We're still in a process, in this investigation process. We have a lot of highly skilled, good mycologists in Brazil working with wild edible mushrooms. And I hope I can also represent them here. But I think we're improving in, in, this, lo in this knowledge uh, now in Brazil. I'm pretty sure 10 years from now, we'll have uh, much more information and many more answers about the wild edible mushrooms in Brazil. So here in Brazil, I've been calling them funks, which means non-conventional uh, edible fungi. So this is the name that we use here, funks. And why not conventional? Because we have some conventional uh, mushrooms we use, uh, but uh, typically Brazilians don't don't use much uh, mushroom in their in their diets. The by far the, the famous one is champignon or portobello. When you when you tell someone let's eat mushroom, this is the the species that everybody has in mind: the champignon and, and portobello. That usually you can eat in a pizza or in stroganoff, some kind of dish that we make here. And, but people doesn't know how is this mushroom. They don't know it's fresh because you buy it canned from a market. And, but we also have some other mushrooms that we have from Asian restaurants. So we have shiitake, shimeji. These are the three top ones. So see, people don't know mushrooms. Sometimes it's just a fancy salad. People say it's expensive. And they don't have this as part of the uh, dairy life to prepare a meal to have mushroom bread. But we have some famous edible mushrooms in Brazil. For example, uh, we have the king bullet, it's the porcini. It's one of the world's most famous edible mushroom. Uh, we also have milk caps, like we have the saffron milk cap, Lactarius geticolor. We also have suilus species like slippery gill. So the species we have here is Willus uh, salmonicolor. We also have morals. It's not easy to find. I've never found one, but I know we have here in Brazil because I'm always checking photos and people sending photos. This photograph is not mine. It's more Kelly Spulenta. It's a beautiful species, uh, but it's not common, but we also can find morals in Brazil. But the thing is, these famous edible mushrooms that we have here in Brazil, they're not native, okay? This means they are exotic species. So they are, oops, sorry. They are mycorrhizal species. So they came to Brazil with the roots of these trees. So we have here in Brazil, pine plantations all around Brazil. We have a lot of pines. Um, these trees are not from Brazil. They came to Brazil and the mushrooms came with the, with the roots. So in southern Brazil, we have subtropical, um, this subtropical area where you can find these mushrooms growing inside the, in the spine plantations. But still, I had these questions. I, I didn't want to know just the famous edible mushrooms, the ones that you can find in pines, but also which native species do we have? Which species uh, are actually here from Brazil? Um, 
So I had this question in mind. I'm going to answer a little later. So well, how many native uh, mushroom species do we have in Brazil? Not just these exotic, uh, famous edible species. Okay, so we have some uh, species, fungal species described for the country, around 7,000. It may look like so, um, it's a, long, a number as a good number, but we estimate that we may have 260,000 fungal species here in Brazil. So we still have a lot of job to do. We still need a lot of taxonomists working with fungal species here in Brazil. And once we have these numbers, a better idea about how many species we have in Brazil, maybe we could, could also have a better idea about how many native uh, um, edible species we have here in Brazil. But we are, already have some numbers, I'm gonna show you later. So if I want to know about the wild edible mushrooms in Brazil, I need to go to the traditional knowledge. So let's talk to people that still eat mushroom. We don't have uh, many more communities in Brazil that have mushrooms in their diets, but we still have some. Okay, so this picture is from France, and this is this young boy, Yanomami boy, holding a basket where he has a lot of edible mushrooms. So we know that Dr. France, who's a famous uh, British botanist, was here in the Brazilian Amazon at the 60s, the 70s, uh, studying plants, but also studying uh, which plants the, these indigenous communities used. And he discovered that some communities used the mushrooms. So at some point, he sent samples to Dr. Osvaldo Fidalgo, which is a Brazilian uh, mycologist. And Dr. Fidalgo was very interested about this edible species. And he asked Franz if they, he could travel together with us to Amazonia and talk with these indigenous and learn more about the, the edible species. So they actually, they went together. They had this expedition together where they couldn't collect a lot of uh, samples. They collect the edible mushrooms. They also uh, recorded some names that indigenous communities have for, for them. And this year I had a chance to talk with Dr. Franz and I asked him why they only investigated the Yanomamis which is this indigenous group that we have in Brazil. And I asked him, so why only the Yanomamis? Why are you just were, were there? The Yanomamis tribes talk with them. And Francis told me that he visited a lot of communities and the Yanomamis were the only ones that were actually had the, the mushrooms in their diets. The other communities or the other tribes, they just consider the, the mushrooms as survival food. They wouldn't, eat mushrooms unless they, they were starving. So they didn't have this uh, close relationship with mushrooms. Also, um, in 2016, this book here in Brazil was released. It's a beautiful book, it's an amazing book. Uh, it's bilingual, so it's written in Portuguese, but also in the Yanomami language, because the idea of this book is to preserve the knowledge that the Yanomamis had have about the, the edible mushrooms. And nowadays you can just download the PDF from the internet, it's available on the internet. And actually this book is about the Sanoma. The Sanoma is one of the Yanomami subgroups in, living in the Brazilian Amazon. And this book is, is, has a lot of photographs, it's very well illustrated, and I always recommend to everyone, including uh, in 2017, this book won a very important and traditional uh, literature uh, prize from Brazil. It's called the Jabuti, Premio Jabuti, which will be the tortoise prize in the culinary category. So this book, uh, they have photographs and description of 15 mushroom species that the Yanomamis use uh, in their diets. They also talk about uh, agriculture management practice because this book was written by the Yanomamis, some school teachers, some elderly that knew about the mushrooms and also some Brazilian scientists. Uh, they also write about how to prepare, how they prepare the mushrooms. Some of them they boil, some of them are roasted. So they also have 
this kind of information is something that's very interesting. They have common names. So we don't have common names for uh, mushrooms in Brazil, which is crazy. Most of them, when I use them during my classes or lecture, are just common names that I translate from Spanish or from English. But we don't have many common names for the Brazilian species. So it's nice that when you investigate this kind of knowledge, ethnomycological knowledge, you can also rescue some common names. And having common names, it's very important for scientific communication. You know, people don't want to say the names in Latin. <laughs> names in Latin are difficult. So we need uh, the vernacular names. We need a name in our language so people can talk about uh, fungi and mycology. So they have common names for those ethnotaxa because, of course, their, their classification of mushrooms is different from our uh, scientific classification, so we call it ethnotaxa, which are the names they give to this group of species. So I'm going to give some uh, funny examples they have. Uh, for example, we have Brisadolia paradoxa. It's a large mushroom, it grows on wood, and they call it tepper liver. I have no idea how <laughs> it's a tepper liver, but probably they find some connection there. Uh, so it, I think it's a good name to use for scientific dissemination because it's curious that uh, pepper is a Brazilian animal we can find here in Brazil and the Indians, the indigenous people have this name. So it's nice that we can have some names to talk about uh, the Brazilian mushrooms. Some are more difficult. Uh, for example, we have some Lentinus species and Panus species, they just call hairy annus. So it's kind of difficult to make scientific dissemination with this common name, maybe we have, I've been calling it Harry Funnels. Uh, yeah, I just made up a, a different name because <laughs> we could have some problems using those for scientific uh, communication. And one thing that's very nice is now that they also, this, this indigenous group, they have organized themselves for collecting and, and now selling the mushrooms. So you can also now find in big cities some, and taste some of those uh, cogumelo yanomami, which is the yanomami mushrooms. So it's a it's very important uh, source, economic source for them. So it's great that now they can also sell the mushrooms because we're sure they make this, this sustainable way of harvesting and collecting the mushrooms. But the thing is, uh, many of these species that the yanomami use their diet and they're also selling the markets. They're just common species. They're tropical species that you can find everywhere else in Brazil, sometimes even uh, inside the cities, in urban areas, you can also find these mushrooms. So it's nice because I, I try to tell people and give this idea, you don't have to go in the middle of the forest, in the middle of Amazonia to search and find these edible mushrooms, just take a look in your neighborhood or some forest fragments near your city, and probably you're going to find some edible mushrooms. So then I started this journey about learning and studying the scientists, the non-conventional edible mushrooms here in Brazil. And everything started in 2018. I was here, I was living for two years already here in the city in Andatuba. We came here because my husband was a professor at the university. I was doing some research, some postdoctoral research. And then they had this event in the city, was in environmental, was this event to talk about the environmental issues from our city. It's organized but by a non-governmental organization. But this, this event is not academic, you know, it's open to the public. And the theme that year, in 2018 was about biodiversity and food. So they invited me to talk about the edible mushrooms. So back in 2018, I didn't know much about edible mushrooms, but I wanted to learn. And I always tell people, you just talk about plants and animals, plants and animals, please let's talk about fungi too. So since they invited me, I had to go there and talk about edible mushrooms. So I prepared this lecture People got really interested when I started talking about the mushrooms, all the benefits, 
And when you eat mushrooms, they're important, they have medicine. And after the lecture, uh, some people came to talk with me, people that were there listening to this lecture. And they, they found that they said to me that the lecture was really interesting, but it was a pity that we didn't have, we didn't have this edible species here in the city. And I was kind of confused and I'm like, yes, but these species are here. We also have this edible species here in Angatuba. And people were like, of course not. Here we just have toxic species. I've never heard about edible species. So I, I started as a personal project, uh, just look for these species, photograph these species, describe these species, because I wanted to present to everybody here in the city how we have edible species here, okay? And they are not difficult to find. So I wanted to show them uh, that you don't need to be afraid of mushrooms. Yeah, may, of course we have toxic species, but many of them are edible. So uh, this book, yeah, the Funkis Jangatuba, which means the edible mushrooms from Andatuba, where I live, I've published in 2019 this book as an ebook. And during 12 months, I was recording the species that occur here. And I found 21 species. So for me, it was a surprise. I didn't know much, as I told you, man, I didn't know much about uh, March 2018. So it was a nice surprise to easily find uh, 21 species of wild edible mushrooms. So in 2019, again, I went to this environmental event and I talked with people and I showed them my results and they got really excited to finally learn that we have edible mushrooms here. So as I told you, for the first time, I, I, I felt this connection. People wanted to know about my job. They were interested to know about the mushrooms. So I found this, I find this a, a nice way to, to talk about scientific uh, communication about mycology. So I've continued the sampling. Of, I, I think I will never stop now, <laughs> but I've continued um, studying the, the edible mushrooms that we have here. So this year I've published the second edition from this book, from this book um, that I had in 2019. And now I have more than the double of the species. I have now 45 uh, edible species that I can find here. And the number is still growing. I still finding more species. I don't know if I'm going to continue publishing <laughs> editions from this book, but I, I try to, to talk a lot with people about this. When, I, when, I talk, when I'm with my students, when I'm giving lectures or giving some courses, I want you people to know that you can find edible mushrooms. I think this is very important people to know. So now, as I told you, I was going to give you the, the answer from, the, from this question. How many native edible mushroom species we have here in Brazil? So we have this uh, great mycologist in Brazil. This is Mariana Drewinski. She's a PhD candidate. She's finishing now her PhD. And she and her professor, who's another great mycologist, Dr. Nelson Menoli Jr., they are coordinating uh, this study to list all the species we have here in Brazil that are edible. And we're getting to this number around 400 species. I believe this is a good number because if you remember at the beginning, I told you that we have around 2,000 edible species in the world. So here in Brazil, we have 400, and I also think the number is growing. We're finding new, new things. It's a good number. So Brazil is, is doing good. <laughs> we have a lot of species here. We don't have just to eat champignon. We have a great diversity, which is kind of obvious because Brazil is such a big country, such a mega diverse country. So for me, it's, kind of, it's obvious that we have also a great diversity of edible species here. So I wanted to show you some, not all these species I have here. I hope you like mushrooms photographs. So since I'm talking about mushrooms, I want to show my kids. And so I'm going to show you some species we have here in Nangatuba. Some of them are, you can find in urban areas, but also in pasture and also in forest fragments. So I'm going to show some of these this, uh, species. So auricularia, it's very common. We can find urban areas, but also you can find in forest fragments. And we have about four 
or five species of auricularia here in Brazil. All of them are edible. So this is an easy one to start. When people ask me, I want to try edible mushrooms. How can I start? I always tell them to start with the easy ones. So auricularia, since they have this cartilaginous texture, it's not difficult to identify. The color is also very characteristic. Uh, in Asia, they call it black fungus. In China, they call it black fungus. And here we call it monkey's ear. So it's a good one. The flavor is not strong, but the texture is very interesting. I really liked uh, eating this mushroom. Well, we have another one, which is easy to identify, and uh, they split gill mushrooms. And as the scientific name says, it's very common. We can find here uh, easily. This wood ear has this hairy surface, the hairy cap. That's why here people call it cougar's ear. I don't like that much the taste. Actually, the texture is kind of corky, it's rubbery. My husband likes it, but there's a lot of uh, traditional communities in Mexico that also use this mushroom. They also have some medicine, medicinal um, properties. Then we have this tiny mushroom. My husband <laughs> said that if you're going to depend on this, probably you're going to starve. Uh, because they're really tiny, but they're so beautiful and, and the texture, it's so nice. They call it fun-shaped jelly fungus and Latropinex spatularia. And these photographs are here from my house. The kids play with it. And of course, it, it's very tiny, but you can use for dishes decoration because the color and the shape is amazing. They also use for dish decoration in, in Asia. Well, and to make a contrast with these tiny ones, we have the huge one. So we have the giant mushroom, which is Macrocybe titans. It's huge. You can find large clusters of these mushrooms. Here's a picture of my daughter Nina holding one of them. It tastes good. Many people doesn't know that this is uh, it's an edible species, and you can find in big cities. Uh, it can it may cause some stomach upset in some people, so you have to be careful for the first time you're going to to try this mushroom, just try a little to see if, you, if you're okay with it. And I also tell people, we're talking here about mushrooms that you can find in urban areas. I always like to tell people, please be careful where you pick up your mushrooms because big cities, because of pollution, and because of pollution sometimes complicated because we know that mushrooms, they accumulate heavy metals so they can be contaminated. So be careful about where you're going to pick uh, your mushrooms. So from pasture, and here are some examples of mushrooms growing on pasture. We have Agaricus campestris, also known as needle mushroom, pink bottle. See, this is a this is a species that I find easily here, including near my home. <laughs> it's very easy to find. And as I told you, sometimes people think that in Brazil mushrooms are expensive. Why? Because we're cultivating species that are not from Brazil. We're cultivating champignon the Agaricus bisporus that came from Europe. And we need low temperature to cultivate this species, which is kind of difficult from Brazil. <laughs> Most of the country are tropical. So we can have um, better ideas using this uh, native species. Something that we, we, can, we, we can think about using native species. And of course, we don't have to, we don't need uh, so much technology to grow them here. We also have Agaricus subirufescens. Here in Brazil, we call sun mushroom. It's also known as almond mushroom. Uh, it has a funny story because this mushroom is from here, from the state of Sao Paulo. And then it was collected by a Japanese family in the 70s and sent to Japan. And they just figured out it was amazing mushrooms. This is amazing for medicinal purpose. And now in Japan, this mushroom is very famous. <laughs> And most people here in Brazil don't know about this mushroom. In fact, if we cultivated this mushroom here in Brazil and we export everything to Japan, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? So uh, it, it also tastes very good. It's not just for medicinal purpose, but also tastes very good. And, and see, we have it, this international market for, for this native mushroom. From the pasture, we also have Macrolepiota. Bonairensis, which is similar to the parasol mushroom. And 
Actually, the parasol mushroom is another species, Macrolepiota procera, but here we have one that's very similar. It's also edible. The cap is edible because the, the stalk is kind of fibrous. The texture is not very good. But here there is a photograph of my boy, Otto, who's playing with one of these mushrooms. I just tell people to be very careful when collecting these mushrooms because it's very similar to a toxic one. Since the cap is light colored with brown scales, you can confuse it with the false parasol, okay? Also called the vomiter, which tells you why you should not eat this species. <laughs> I think it's a very uh, funny common name, the vomiter. So the difference is the green gill parasol, which is this false parasol, parasol um, has the, um, this four print is green. Uh, it's not always that you can see the greenish tint in the gills. So it's, it's worth to take this spore print, check this spore print before eating, because the true parasol has a light color spore print. And this toxic mushroom uh, has the green spore print. So avoid this mushroom. And as I always say, please, please do not eat mushrooms if you're not 100%, 120% sure about its identification. Take to someone that understands or read some books or know about this because maybe just an experience can end up very badly. So uh, be sure about the mushrooms identification before eating them. And I'm gonna show you some uh, beautiful species that we find in forest fragments. They're much more common in forest fragments. So we have the honeycomb mushroom, which species is Favolus brasiliensis, is one of the Yanomami species. And we also have here, I mean, we have all around Brazil this species. It's called honeycomb, of course, because underneath the cap, the hexagonal pores looks like a uh, honeycomb. That's why they, it has this common name. We also have the pink oyster mushroom, which is funny because we find it in the market. A lot of people just know this species from the market, but we also have here in our, in our forest, in our native forest, and when growing the forest, you can find large ones that you never find in the supermarket. But of course, because the, for the supermarket, they harvest the mushroom when they're still tiny. But you can find the huge ones there. It's a very beautiful species. The color, it's, it's amazing. Uh, we also have Odemanciella cubensis. It's similar to the porcelain mushrooms. The, the porcelain mushrooms, it's Odemanciella mucida, if I'm not wrong. So it's similar to, to that species, but it has these scales on the cap. Uh, the funny thing is about this species, it's not just edible for us. I've, I've also been conducting some uh, studies about which mushrooms the animals from Brazil, the Brazilian fauna eats. And I'm seeing a lot of records about the Brazilian squirrel and the Brazilian squirrel eats this mushroom. Also the white head of possum we have here in Brazil, it's these mushrooms. So I'm also getting to the conclusion that it's, it's an important species for the, the whole forest, not just for us. So I, I've been uh, lately very um, careful about collecting these species because I, I realize it's also important for, other, for, for the animal forests in their diets. And this one, this species, it's amazing. Actually, it's not a, a basidiomycete, it's an ascomycete, so it's a kind of cup fungi. And the first time I saw, I cried because I'm this kind of people that when see beautiful things start crying. And I knew it was this species because I, I've read this paper from Argentina, from Roberto, from Robledo, Gerardo Robledo and Andrea Romero, talking about they, they had rediscovered this species in Argentina. And I remember when I read the article, I, I was just thinking, my God, this species is so beautiful. I really want to see this one day and I'll check my list. So this is Richiella edulis. We don't have a name for it. I've been calling it the Swiss cheese mushroom. <laughs> uh, the, the cap surface is brown. I think it's kind of difficult to find it because the color of the cap surface is very similar with the leaves and the twigs on the floor and the forest floor. But underneath the cap, uh, it has this yellow color 
and it's all cavernulose. It's, it's really beautiful, uh, the mushroom. Uh, the, the species name, Adelis, indicated that this species is, you can eat it, it's edible. <laughs> this is when Spegazzini described this species from Paraguay in the 19th century. But, but then we didn't have further information about it. We were not sure if this species, if this species were, was edible or not. And recently we, we heard about the report about this, it's also Brazilian mycologist, she ate it, very brave. <laughs> but then she ate the mushroom and she confirmed that it's edible and tastes very nice with butter. So yeah, nice. Now we know that this species is actually edible. <laughs> Well, and just to finish my talk, I'd like to talk about some new discoveries about the wild edible mushrooms. Uh, this species, the purple honeycomb, uh, it's not a new species, so the discovery is not that this is a new species, it was already described, but nobody knew that this species was edible, and now we can say that uh, this species is. It's because the, when I was doing the research for my book, I discovered this family, uh, here in our region. They are not from here, but they are living here and they eat a lot of mushrooms and they were eating these mushrooms. So now we have this data that the purple honeycomb is edible. Uh, we also found these huge mushrooms. Uh, here some people call the false porcini. Uh, we found these huge mushrooms growing in a, in a farm. And we asked the owner, we were doing some ethnomycological studies there. He was the one that showed the mushrooms to us. And he was curious if he could eat the mushroom or not. He didn't know if he, he could eat, if it was toxic. And then we told him that we were going to investigate. Then I've heard a lot of reports from different areas in Brazil that people eat it many times because they mistaken the, the mushroom with the porcini. So I've tried also the mushroom. And it tastes good. It's a good um, edible mushroom. We also published a short note about this. So the first time we could say, because we couldn't find this data in literature, if this species, Phlebopus dominicus, was edible or not. But since we've tried and we've heard reports about it, then we published a note about this, that this species is edible. And also uh, last year, I found this mushroom, which is a species similar to lion's mane. And this one probably is a new species to science. We've been investigated. I've already done some microscopy work with it and check the spores. So probably it's a new species. I've also tasted the mushroom. It tastes very good. I read some recipes on the internet how to prepare. And it tastes really tastes like crab. And I've just ate it with lemon. It was, it was very good. And this is probably something we still have to publish um, as a new species. So I think this is, I wanted to tell you, and here I have my email, but also I have an Instagram account, which is Planky Nakabisa, where I publish uh, some of my discoveries. I, actually this profile on Instagram is for scientific uh, communication, insemination about the wild edible mushrooms. And I'm sorry, but it's in Portuguese because <laughs> As I told you, we have we don't have much information in Portuguese or, or about the Brazilian species. So I really want to do something in Portuguese so people can understand more about these mushrooms. But you can follow me there and find some beautiful pictures. And I think that's it, <laughs> Joao. All right. Thank you very much, Larissa, for this beautiful presentation. And well, I, I, I would like to ask the first question. So uh, any of you in the audience, so please type your questions on in the Q&A section if you have any questions. So my first question is that is quite impressive, the diversity of mushrooms and, and fungi in general we have in Brazil. But despite that, we, we don't have such a culture, as you mentioned, to eat mushrooms. Well, it, it's even worse when we talk about uh, wild mushrooms. So people think about hallucinogenic, psychedelic mushroom or poisonous mushrooms. So there's really, um, people are really afraid of mushrooms, think they're toxic, don't even touch it and etc. So in the, mm -hmm. I have noticed in the last 10 years or so that we can gradually start to find like even the, the common mushrooms like fresh mushrooms 
in markets in Brazil and so on. So do you see like any perspective of having mycophagy or, or this habit of eating mushrooms more widespread in Brazil? Do you see that as a, a thing we're getting more into our culture? Yes, yes, for sure. As I told you, public in general are not very interested in mushrooms, but, but I already see this movement growing, you know, especially mushroom hunting and foraging. I already see a lot of people interest. We also have Brazilian chefs that are interested in the Yanomamis mushrooms, in the Brazilian truffle that Dr. Marcelo Susbacher is also another great Brazilian mycologist discovered here in Brazil. And where people are interested to write books, recipe books, when I, when I give talks, lectures, or courses, people come to talk to me because they are interested in the edible mushrooms. And sometimes I, I do this with students when I give a, a course or a lecture. I ask them if they have already proved they have a, sometimes né, already tasted the wild edible mushrooms, if they would like to. And most of them answer me that they would like to, but they didn't have the opportunity. So I, I see there is some curiosity, and I think that we have, we're going to have a different scenario, maybe in 10 years or 20 years, I think we're going to have a different scenario in Brazil. And especially because I think scientific, uh, scientific communication and dissemination is very important. So for us, mycologists, is a duty, if I can say that, but it's important for us to continue this, to stop mycophobia, so people you don't have to be afraid of mushrooms. Just don't eat mushrooms that you're not sure, but otherwise you can touch mushrooms, take kids to forage, it's so funny. They like it so much and so good for us. We've been this terrible lockdown these years. You will see how, how good it is to go out in the woods, to be in the forest looking for, for mushrooms for me. It's like a therapy. So I, I, I really believe that this movement is growing in Brazil. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I, I see this forest here in the US and it's a really amazing place to make new friends. Every single person there is an amazing person usually. So it's a really interesting crowd of people to interact. So we have another uh, question here. Is the Richiella closely related to Citeria? Richiella related to Citella? Citaria. Citaria. Ah, Citaria. Citaria. Okay. Citaria is this uh, parasitic mushrooms from Notophagus from southern Argentina. Uh, they are just related because they're ascomycetes, <laughs> but uh, they're not that related. They, I think they are even in different families. So I, mm -hmm. I don't think they're, they're very related, especially because Richiella dulis is not uh, parasitic mushrooms. It's just growing on, on that wood. It's a probiotic. And so it's a different group. It's, it looks like kind of similar. There are my seeds, but they're they're not so much related. Right. Yeah, I think we would fall on those uh, um, parallel evolution or convergent evolution of uh, morphology that we can have, for example, uh, gasteroids across the phylogeny and, and so truffle-like morphology mm -hmm. scattered along the phylogeny. So it's not a single origin for a specific morphology. Yeah, yeah. so that's really interesting. So I would like to thank you, Larissa. So for you all in the audience, so if you miss any part of this event or wish to watch it again, a recording has been saved and will be published in the NYBG lecture library, the science section. And thank you for being with us today and hope you enjoy the future science webinars. And until next time, please stay well and Goodbye, everyone, and thank you once again, Larissa, for this beautiful talk. And I hope Brazil gets more aware of these, these uh, wild edible mushrooms, and then we can consume it more often. Thank you very much, Larissa. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Right. Bye bye. bye, -bye.